also wanted to remind you about the uh, source assignment, uh, your sources uh, for your research paper. Those are due on um, Thursday, um, so make sure to have those in uh, by Thursday. Uh, if you're having trouble finding anything, um, you know, get with me as soon as possible so I can uh, help, have enough time to, to help you find some things that will be useful. Um, but don't forget to complete that. As well, the study guide for the first exam is available in Blackboard, the, the midterm exam. The midterm will be two weeks from today, so uh, the Monday uh, after lectureship week. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the exam. We won't go into too much uh, detail, um, but essentially it will consist of uh, two parts. Uh, the first part is knowledge about specific people, um, movements, doctrines, um, and, and all sorts of uh, things related to that. So questions related to uh, you know, kind of the, the who's this person, who's that person, what's this movement about, um, those kind of things. The, the, the study guide list is on Blackboard. Let me go ahead and uh, pull it up here. Available under uh, study guides. Doesn't doesn't consist of everybody we've, we've talked about. Let me try to go back and see if I can. There we go. Consists of a variety of, of different views and doctrines and people, and movements. Um, try to keep them relatively in the order that we have covered them, so you can go back uh, through your notes um, if you need to, to figure out where the different things are. And by all means, if you're not sure uh, about something specifically, uh, feel free to get in contact with me uh, about that. Uh, you know, if you're having problems finding a particular individual or a particular um, term there. So the, uh, the first section will involve those terms, will be multiple choice questions, maybe some short answer, around just general knowledge of those terms. Who is this person? What is this movement? What is this event? Um, and largely, it's, you know, it's meant to help cull what we've been talking about, about now down to what I really want you to focus on. We, we've talked about a lot more than what was on that list. Um, but um, these are the ones that I want you to focus on. So, for example, um, just to talk about two terms and to kind of give you some ideas about what kind of information I, I would like you to know, uh, for the colloquy of Marburg, um, something like that, I'd want you to know, um, for example, who was involved in it. Right? In this case, it was an in interaction between Luther and Zwingli. And what was it about? What was about the issues of, of communion? How, how is Christ present in communion? So that's generally what I want you to know. There could be a short answer identification or short answer question about what was the colloquy of Marburg all about? Right? And essentially I would look for you to say um, differing views on Christ's presence in communion. So general knowledge. Um, you're not going to need to know like anything related to the date. You're not, you're not going to need to know the fact that there was uh, 15 out of 16 issues that Luther and Zwingli agreed on, but it was that, you know, the four of the five last points, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So the, the actual details uh, wouldn't necessarily be something you would need to know. So focusing on general knowledge, like if, if you were to tell somebody outside the class what the colloquy of Marburg was all about, that's the kind of knowledge that I would want you to have. Uh, when it comes to a person like uh, Jonathan Edwards, who we'll talk about today, essentially kind of some general information on who, who was he. Right? Well, he's, he was a minister um, involved in uh, revivalism of the 18th century. Why is he important? We'll talk about, again, about that today. But 
I'm not going to ask you to know the names of the sermons, where you went to school. And I, I talk about that kind of stuff to kind of give you a background, kind of flesh out these people a little bit, give you some idea of what shaped them, but general knowledge about who Jonathan and Edwards was, or Henry VIII, or Mark Luther, and any of those people, who they were, why they were important. You know, and so, you know, I could uh, certainly see a, a question where I um, ask you, like a multiple choice question, and uh, ask you, who was Jonathan Edwards, and, uh, you know, one option might be a minister in 18th century New England, who was involved with emotional revivals at the time, a, um, a governmental official in 16th century Germany who was interested in protecting Martin, Martin Luther, uh, you know, and so I'll give you a couple different options. I mean, you know, the, op the answer in that case would be the 18th century ministry. So general knowledge types of things. Who are these people? What's this movement? What's this event? Some of those um, terms on Blackboard include things like the views on justification in the Reformation. So generally, what was Luther's view on justification? What was Wingley's view on justification? What was Calvin's view on justification? That's basically what I'm looking for you uh, to know, and those are the kind of questions I would ask you. So the first part is going to be based on the, that term section, general knowledge section. The second part is going to uh, involve um, an essay question. Um, now, again, on Blackboard, I provide you this information, so you don't need to try to copy it down. It's, it's there on the study guide on Blackboard. But essentially, what I'm going to do is provide you with two essay questions drawn from these four topics. You will decide which of those two you want to write on. So you'll be writing one essay, but you'll have your choice. And essentially, the essays are going to be talk about a political development in the, the Reformation period, the 17th century, the 18th century, or talk about a cultural and societal development in the, 16th, the Reformation in the 17th, the 18th. Right. So that's basically what it's going to be. So if you have one thing that we talked about in each of those time periods, in politics, culture, and society, doctrine, and practice, you'll be in good shape to write about these essays, write these essays. Um, and so what I'm basically looking for you to do is to kind of pull together some of the material we've been talking about and be able to talk about, you know, how is this changing? What are these developments that are taking place um, along one specific line, politics or culture and society? In this case, as you look back through your notes and decide on, okay, I want to talk about the 30 years war in the 17th century in politics, for example, make sure you focus on talking about how Christianity relates to that. Right? I'm not looking for you to just talk about politics. It's going to be, right, why, why does this have something to do with church history? And so think about that with the, the politics, the, the, uh, the culture and society, especially doctrine and practice, of course, um, you know, we're talking about the actual living out of church life, so that's a little bit easier to think about how does that relate to Christianity. What questions do you have at this point? What can I clarify, explain a little bit more fully, give you some better ideas on? So, on the exam, there'll only be two essays to choose from, or there'll be those four? There, there'll be two essays to choose from, those four. from those four. So there might be an essay on politics and culture and society. Right. But as long as you're prepared for all four of these, you should be in good shape. Um, what other questions? And again, you'll have your choice, you, you know, so you don't have to, you know, as you get there, if you feel more comfortable writing about politics and doctrine, you'll be okay. As you go over the study guide, as you prepare for the midterm, right, two weeks from today, Whatever I can do to help you with, you know, by all means, uh, let me know. Um, one thing I do want to say about the, the terms list, um, I, I've known in other classes of, of students working together on the terms list, kind of breaking it down where, you know, this person takes the first 10 and this person takes the next 10 and, you know, everybody kind of divides and conquers. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, you're going to write your exam by yourself. And so if you're preparing with other people, that's fine. Just kind of make sure anything you didn't do to look over and make sure it's right. 
All right, so if you have somebody else helping you uh, as you're preparing to study, you know, just make sure that information is right. I've had situations where somebody, for whatever reason, got something wrong and it ended up three or four people got the question wrong because they were working together and that was the part that that one person was working on and they got it wrong. All right, so as, as questions come up, uh, by all means get in contact with me, whether it's I can't find this in the notes, can you tell me what, where, where to look, um, or if you're not sure, right, you say, okay, I'm, I'm looking at this term and these are the kind of things that I have down in my notes or this is what I would think it's about, is this right, you know, I can, I can help you with that and say, okay, you need to know this, this other thing you don't really need to know. So this, whatever I can do to help you, please let me know with that. We have a few things to uh, finish up today from uh, culture and society and thinking about it in the 18th century Christianity. As we were finishing last Wednesday, we were in the midst of talking about African and African Americans and slavery and thinking about some of the changes that were occurring there. In the, in the 18th century, slavery in the colonies is largely becoming something that is part of southern North America as well as Brazil, the Caribbean, some other places like that. Uh, in northern North America, New England, uh, New York, mid-Atlantic colonies, um, slavery is starting to die out, largely, again, because of the economic viability of slavery. Um, it's, it's atrocious to kind of think about how people's lives hung in the balance based on uh, their economic worth, but essentially that's what happened. Why slavery became prominent in the southern United States was due to the economics of the situation. Now, there was a lot of racism involved uh, on, in both the North and the South of uh, the North American colonies, and even in Central and South America. But a lot of, a lot of that was shaped by um, trying to justify the economic exploitation of labor. A couple of things we talked about Wednesday, we talked again about uh, you know, some of the changes and, and developments that were taking place uh, as the uh, 17th moved into the 18th century, the commonalities that existed between African religions and Christianity as well as some of the differences. We also talked about the origins of the society for the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts. A missionary endeavor by the Anglican Church, the Church of England, uh, to try and increase their missionary activity. And predominantly for our context, context now thinking about slavery, there's the question of uh, you know, educating Africans in um, North American colonies to Christianity, specifically Anglicanism. But the major issue in the 18th century for a lot of Christians was this concern about the conversion of slaves and how that would affect the slave-master relationship. Ultimately, a lot of people felt that baptism of slaves did not mean that they needed to be free. In the 19th century, we'll talk about, when we get to the 19th century and we talk about slavery, uh, we'll talk a lot more about the biblical justification that people used to say that this was okay with God. Um, but largely right now, the time period we're talking about, the ultimate concern is, is this going to change the status of this person? Because for a lot of slave masters, um, if they were going to be freed, I'd rather not teach them Christianity, which is a horrible position to think of that somebody would actually have as a Christian. And so a lot of colonists kind of assuaged that, uh, that concern by passing laws in the 18th century that said, essentially, that baptizing slaves did not change their social status. And in fact, some ministers required slaves who wanted to have baptism to agree that baptism did not free them before they would baptize them. Uh, you know, and so kind of is, you know, they would have to agree before they could be baptized. The continual message in the sermons of the time, whether that's from Anglicans or, or other groups, was the passages from places like Ephesians and Colossians that emphasized servants obey your masters. 
And so the continual message was uh, one of uh, subservience, submission to authority, and obedience. Largely, even though there is an entire society devoted to this um, propagation of the gospel, the Anglicans had very little success in converting slaves, especially those slaves that had been born in Africa. Now, we'll hint a little bit about a period of time in the middle of the 1700s known as the Great Awakening, and we'll say much more about it on Wednesday. But the group that developed out of the Great Awakening, evangelicalism, made it much, or was much more successful in converting slaves, at least visibly. And people of, of African descent were more likely to join the Baptist Church, later the Methodist Church, than they were to the Anglican Church. Largely because of a couple of things. Evangelicals in the 18th century emphasized equality much more than the Anglicans did. And so that message of equality under the gospel was one that was much more um, appealing to those held in bondage. Now, by the, by the 19th century, evangelicals have changed their position. And evangelicals in the South are some of the most vociferous argument of people arguing for um, keeping slaves in bondage. But in the 18th century, the preaching of equality, as well as the licensing of black preachers, the Anglicans would not appoint any Africans or African Americans in either the North or the South as licensed preachers. The Baptists, for example, would. And so that also was something that was appealing as well. There were other things that kind of provided a barrier to conversion to Christianity in this time. We've talked about before that it's estimated anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of slaves were Muslims. And so they're already coming with a, a religious system. Some of those uh, maintained their commitment to Islam in, uh, in enslavement. Uh, in other cases, though, some slaves did uh, adopt Christianity, at least outwardly. And we'll say more about that in the 19th century. And then finally, the hypocrisy of white Christians often acted as a barrier to conversion. They're saying these things in their sermons, but they're living something else throughout the rest of the week. That's not to say, though, of course, that there was entirely no response in the 18th century. There were some slaves that did welcome instruction. And it could have been for a variety of reasons. Certainly, some people could have been interested in the message of Jesus, but there were other things that we might think of as, as practical matters that would have been useful as well, or encouraging as well. So for some people, instruction was a good way to miss work. So instead of having to toil in the fields, you could sit at uh, sit in a, in a church building, uh, you know, sit in a Bible study, and so there was the opportunity to get out of work. Additionally, it often did provide some slaves with kind of a, a, a means of judging their masters by practicing their master's religion better than the master did. Right? And so it gave some slaves an air of superiority because they were better Christians than their white masters were. And then a final reason some people would have found Christianity appealing, other than just the message itself, was that it often provided, not, well, not often, this is not a good term, it provided a means for rebellion. A way to resist the horrors of slavery, whether that's kind of a psychological resistance or the breaking out of physical violence. In the 19th century, we'll talk about some of those slave rebellions and how that um, often came out of certain forms of Christianity. The last thing I want to talk about with respect to 18th century uh, African and African American culture, and colonies especially, is to talk about the, some of the free blacks in the North who started their own denominations. 
Now, a lot of the practice of Christianity among those of African descent in the 18th century was shaped by white European Christianity. There really wasn't that much of a distinctiveness. By the 19th century, however, there is a lot more, uh, we'll talk about spirituals, we'll talk about other forms of, of the practice of African American Christianity that was different than white European Christianity. But there were also occasions where African Americans stood up to start their own forms of Christianity. Perhaps one of the most famous in the 18th century is Richard Allen and uh, his uh, partner in all of this, Absalom Jones. Allen was born in Philadelphia toward the end of the 18th century. Uh, his master was a lawyer and would later be a chief justice. Early in his life, however, he was sold, along with a lot of his family, to a planter in Delaware, so moving out of kind of the urban setting into a more rural and field setting. His family would be split later as his mother and several of his siblings would be sold again. Allen eventually converted to Methodism, and we'll talk about Methodism on Wednesday. And not only did he convert, but he was very active in spreading the message. And so he, he taught his remaining siblings, he was going around not only teaching Christianity, but the Methodist form of Christianity as well. So welcome was this among his master's family that he allowed Richard to bring in preachers to speak to the other slaves. During that time, his master happens to be around, listens to one of them preach, and becomes convicted that slaveholding is wrong. But he's not entirely sure what to do about dealing with his slaves, because he certainly doesn't feel confident in selling them to continue let somebody else hold them in bondage. But there were a lot of laws that didn't allow just freeing slaves. So he, you know, one of the things he does is convince Richard Allen to try and find opportunities to buy his freedom. And so during the Revolutionary War, Allen's master encouraged him to work for revolutionary forces and gain enough money to be free, which he is able to do, um, upon which time he takes the last name, Allen. After his freedom, he continued preaching and teaching to whoever would listen, white or black, eventually starting the Free African Society with Absalom Jones, uh, who was another uh, free black as well. Essentially, the Free African Society was a means to help other Africans and African Americans, to help each other out economically uh, in other ways, provide kind of a communal support system. Allen and Jones continued to preach as well uh, and gained quite a few converts there in Philadelphia and the surrounding region. They are members of the St. George's Methodist Church in Philadelphia. And while Allen and Jones are having a lot of success, there is a lot of tension growing between uh, the white leaders of the church and Jones and Allen and some of the black converts. A lot of it comes to a head in 1787, in November, when white trustees of the, the church try to force blacks from the front rows of the gallery further back. The black church members decide we're leaving, so they all exited together. Allen and Jones uh, started the African church out of the Free African Society and, and later renamed, renamed it the Bethel African Church. There is, however, some dif disagreement between uh, this church. Some members, like Jones and others, wanted to be Episcopalians. Uh, which is a, the American form of the Anglican Church after the Revolution. And Jones will eventually become the first African-American Episcopal priest in the United States. Allen, however, wanted to stay within the Methodist Church. And so he starts, uh, eventually starts the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or sometimes abbreviated AME. largely because a lot of the racial tensions that existed within Methodism at the time kind of continued to distance themselves, kind of press themselves, so he starts an entirely new denomination rather than stay in the Methodist Church. In 
And so for African and African Americans toward the end of the 18th century in the United States, you have some Africans uh, and African Americans who are participating in white churches. Right? If they're enslaved, going to uh, whatever church their master tells them to do. Um, a lot of black congregations will eventually be started, and then also some uh, distinctly African American denominations. All of this, of course, looking back at it in hindsight, of course, is building up to more the 19th century and a lot of things that are going on in the 19th century. And so we'll say more about all of that in, um, as we get back after uh, the mid -term. Any remaining questions about um, culture and society or anything we've talked about here with African-Americans African and slavery? 